Yeah. Yeah, sweet. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, can you all hear me? Sweet. Um, yeah, I wasn't expecting a room so full. Uh, thanks for jumping in. Uh, this session is about uh, disruptive trends in the, re in the web, and this session was given to a customer, a media customer in Singapore. It was originally one hour with the content, so I'm going to rush through some of the slides and not play all the videos, but um, by all means, uh, check the slides out afterwards and uh, um, give it a, a watch of the stuff you missed. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm Sean. Uh, I'm a technical account manager for Aquia, working out of Wellington. There's uh, three employees in Wellington. Um, or New Zealand, and I've been with Drupal for uh, about eight years, give or take. Uh, and about the session, hopefully we can give you some insight into some of the things I see coming this year and next year. Uh, it is interactive, so don't feel you need to hold on to that question until right at the very end. Just uh, raise your hand and yell it out. It won't be too technical. I'm going to paint everything with uh, pictures. And uh, here's a link you can uh, copy down, other than having to remember a Google Docs URL, you can remember bit.ly slash DTW, or Disruptive Trends in the Web Drupal South DS. And there's a lot of links at the back as well. So at the back of the slides are like 10 pages of links, so if you want to research more stuff, you can. The first one is uh, progressive web apps, uh, which is uh, what I call the rise of the service worker. And what this means, essentially it's a set of browser features that m enable the browser to feel more like a, a native application. And as far as what that means feature-wise, you've got offline first. So traditionally, if you're on a web browser and you go to a website and there's no internet, you don't have a good time, right? Um, there is OS integration, so you get, it, may, it feels more like a native app with uh, things such as app drawers and menu items. Uh, you get push notifications, so say you're operating a news site and there's breaking news in your area, potentially this might be useful. And uh, potentially it might be more useful to synchronize some stuff in the background when you don't even have the website open. So as I said earlier, traditional website with internet, guy's pretty happy, right? See a big happy face. <laughs> and then he has no internet. Now he's sad. And see, as you can see, I'm really good at this kind of stuff, right? Um, now what we do is introduce this concept of a service worker, which acts as a broker <laughs> and between yourself and the internet. And why that's kind of cool is you can also maintain this cache sort of version off to the side as well. So that when you do have no internet. Yeah. Yeah. So the background synchronization can do that. Can like, for instance, it can retrieve recent news items and can store that in the cache, so that when you do come online and there is no internet, you still get a representation of the site. It may not be perfectly up to date because you don't have internet, but it'll be up to date enough. Are you referring to creating data locally and have that synchronized later? Uh, yeah, I guess it could be used for that as well. Um, I mean, the idea is it's, it's just a bucket you can store stuff in. I mean, you can, there's actually a check in the service worker to say, do I have internet? So in your JavaScript, you could do some cool stuff to say, if I do have internet, then try, send it, and if I don't, do it later. Uh, a real life example for this is, say that you are on a train and uh, you know, your internet's always a bit patchy, especially in Sydney, you're going through tunnels. Um, you get a breaking news item pop up on your phone saying, you know, I don't know, kangaroos broken loose from the zoo. And uh, you click on a notification and you get to read the article immediately, even though you have really terrible internet. And all the assets are there and it's a, you know, generally a good experience. And here's a slide I just ripped off uh, a Google presentation. Um, but it gives you the idea. If you have a service worker, then things can happen in the background. So the initial time to load the page, you get something like, if you've ever used the Twitter app on a mobile, where it loads immediately, and then 
when you have it open, it then synchronizes. So you can have a model like that, where the first render is incredibly quick, and fresh content comes in later, aka this two seconds. And the question on everyone's mind is that, can I actually use it? Um, the answer is maybe. Um, about 60% of the uh, devices on the internet now support it to some degree. Uh, the most notable exception is mobile iOS. Um, and the, the great thing about it is that if it doesn't support it, it gracefully degrades. So you just don't get the features that you do get with the service worker. Cool. Um, next one is accelerated mobile pages, uh, which is essentially a Google initiative to make the mobile web faster. So uh, this, or AMP, is, is this what this is affectionately known as. So uh, it relies on this new kind of standard called AMP HTML. It's open, and it relies on existing technologies uh, such as HTML, and these are you can link your normal page of, of content to the app version with uh, canonical URLs and stuff like that. Here's an example of that in action. So there's a Drupal module, affectionately called AMP as well. There's a Drupal theme, which you required as well. And how it works is you just append query param AMP on the end of your, your URL, and it will produce markup that will conform to the spec. And then you ask, well, why would I go to all that trouble to make another version of the website? Like, isn't this going backwards 10 years? And uh, it's a good question. Um, here's some reasons why you might want to think about doing this. Number one, Google caches the content. You don't serve any of these page views. And Google has a CDN. They're pretty good at it, right? They've, they've been doing it for a while now. These pages are by design limited with what you can do. They're optimized for speed. And pretty much all pages on AMP will load on a decent uh, phone these days in one second or less. That's complete. That's done. That's finished rendering. All, can, all done. You can still use standard plugins or extensions. Um, there are ad, ads, for instance, if you need ads. You can still have analytics. Uh, it's just that. Yeah, the, the, the syntax is slightly different. There are other extensions as well, like this for YouTube videos, Brightcode videos, all sorts of other sort of plugins like that. There's zero impact to SEO, as long as you use the canonical URL and point that back to your master version. And uh, there are Drupal modules as well. So if this is something that interests you, yeah, give them a whirl. Um, they actually make a... Uh, make it pretty easy out of the box. And uh, if we just talk a bit more about this SEO aspect of things, um, it's no secret that PageRank does take into account things such as how fast your website loads and whether you're not your site is mobile friendly. And there's a tool you can go to check how fast your site is and whether it's mobile friendly. And it wouldn't be too hard to say that in the future, Google will start biasing AMP content versus non-AMP content. And then this killer question comes up, well, why do I want to give my content to Google, right? It's my content, I like it, you know? Here's some, here's some just numbers just uh, shotgunned over the fence. Um, so these are actual media organizations with actual implementations of AMP. And this is what th they've seen. And this is quite recent. This came out in, I think, June, these stats as well. So in, in general, there's some pretty awesome benefits for adopting this. And yeah. The next question is, like, for people who have never seen it, um, this little icon down the bottom, AMP, with a little uh, lightning bolt, uh, looks is basically what that means. So when you click on that result, you'll get the AMP version, and uh, it will load pretty quickly. At the back of the slides, there's a, there's a URL you can go to called um, g.co slash amp demo, which will give you this experience on a mobile phone. You can actually use it now. So you'll only see it on a mobile phone? Correct. Okay. Yep, only, it's only on mobile. So if you search on desktop, you won't see amp. But uh, you get served two, two, two results. 
Only mobile phone. One's the AMP version, one's not. Yep, it'll, Google will bias AMP over the non-AMP version on a mobile. And at the moment, non-AMP and AMP will be spliced together. Um, but you know, as it gets more popularity, as people start adopting it, um, as I said, I think they might sort of change that mentality. And um, for people that have seen Facebook Instant Articles, has anyone heard of that? Just raise your hand. Facebook Instant Articles. <coughs> cool. So about half, but it's it's like the same thing. But um, essentially, Facebook is very much a world garden, and uh, and you need to have a login to get to it. And you know, you're in Facebook City once you're there. Um, anyway, next one, Drupal eight. This probably won't be too revolutionary for the people in the room, but I'll gloss over it at a high level. And remember, this was uh, aimed at non-technical folks. So, um, in general, Drupal eight uh, content authoring much nicer, especially if you add on Lightning uh, into the mix as well. And uh, James is doing a talk tomorrow uh, on Lightning, so give that a will. Um, it's responsive. Uh, Drupal 7 and Fingers, not the best. Um, Drupal 8 and Fingers, pretty good. Views can expose uh, web services now. So that means uh, making decoupled apps with Drupal 8 as a back end is uh, much nicer. And for the devs in the room, you already know this, but I'll go over it anyway. Symphony, Twig, uh, Front end libraries and uh, yeah, more kick ass testing. So, if you went to the last session on PHP unit, <coughs> um, this will ring a bell. And what's happened since 8.0? Well, we've had 8.1 come out in April, uh, where we got a few new experimental modules. Uh, Big Pipe, written by Wim Lears, who's some sort of caching ninja. <laughs> um, Migrate UI. Now you can actually see what migration looks like rather than this, the command line, so that's pretty helpful. Uh, inline form errors, so I don't know, have you ever seen a Drupal, you fill a form in and you stuff something up, click save, you get scrolled right to the top with some vague message saying you fill something in wrong. Um, that module at least aims to make that suck less. 8.2 just came out uh, recently and uh, quite a lot of uh, new modules in here as well. So place block, uh, yeah, if, you, if you've not heard about these things, definitely jump in and read about them, but place block is basically bringing the concept of going away from the admin and the back end to bring it in the front end, so that you can see where you're going to place the block before placing it. The same with the settings tray module, there's an attempt to configure certain parts of the site while you're in the site. Uh, you've got workbench moderation, essentially. It's been renamed content moderation. You've got date time range, so you can have start and end dates. And uh, Big Pipe got promoted from alpha to beta, so that's pretty good. And I don't know if this will work. It may or may not. Maybe they don't have internet. But does that work on Acquia? What's, big pipe, all, all big pipe requires is, <clears throat> this is a demo for it if you don't know what it is. Um, big pipe is a mechanism for flushing early and keeping the connection open. So you can essentially flush the easy stuff quickly, like you see here. And then as your hard stuff renders, it will flush it incrementally. So all you need to have is a connection to a service that supports streaming, essentially. And uh, if you're using Acquia, you potentially are using Cloudflare. Cloudflare supports it. And uh, Acquia balancers also support it as well through Varnish. So um, you can start using this now. Next. Cool. Just Drupal distributions. <clears throat> the key theme here is why reinvent the wheel? And so many people love reinventing the wheel, but the wheel's pretty round now, so um, let's just use someone else's wheel. Uh, and you'll, you'll find in organizations that as they grow in complexity, as the number of 
I guess, web properties increases that um, it gets quite complex to keep them up to date, keep them uh, consistent. And um, if you saw Dave Sparks talk earlier, they're talking about a bit of this, trying to reduce that complexity, reducing the custom craft, reducing the snowflakiness of each site. So the solution, have a look at extracting those common parts of functionality that you use for every single build. And uh, examples are your workflow, your content types, how you do media, how you integrate with social media, your email marketing, your EDMs, and uh, use this as a base for all your sites. So um, things that are out there right now, uh, one example is Thunder. Thunder's a Drupal distro, which is Drupal 8, which is focused entirely on digital publishing. So if you have a news site, uh, a magazine, uh, anything editorial, uh, then give this a serious consideration. This is funded by a German conglomerate, I think, called Berta Media. They have like 300 web properties under their control, and this is their solution to it. Um, so, and they're still actively working on it, like right now. So. Uh, in terms of just bundling a whole bunch of functionality that you normally see, like paragraphs for making the content so you can slam stuff in really nicely, you know, O-embed for embedding Twitter, you know, it's all been thought about. And here's a little quote by Dries, but he says, uh, I believe that publishers should not compete through CMS technology, but through their content and their brand. So Dries is basically saying that this is more or less a solved problem for these guys. You know, you don't need to be competing on that stuff. Let's focus on what you actually do well. And there's a video I won't play here because um, it's just too damn long. Um, but um, Berta Media, this is the guys who, who make it. And uh, um, check that out later. Uh, I need to talk about lightning a little bit. It's uh, I guess it's a distribution made by Acquia that aims to empower developers to create um, basically better editorial experiences than they got to be allowed. And um, empower the editorial teams. So the idea with Lightning is you, don't, you shouldn't need to undo anything that Lightning has done. And you normally with a distribution, you start with it and go, oh, I don't really like that, that sucks. You know, so, um, that's not the idea with Lightning. So the idea of Lightning, you start with that, it gives you a really good head start, gives you some better content editorial experiences, gives you a bit of a launching pad. <coughs> uh, last thing is uh, this idea of uh, having omni-channel. So kind of sounds like a, a buzzword that they kind of like to chuck around at things, but. I'll kind of break that down to what I mean, or what I think that means, in the context for Drupal. So traditionally with websites, you've got stuff that's risky to change. And you've also got stuff that's, you know, so the risky stuff is anything that requires like change control, like if you've got like, uh, I don't know, an importer script that's scraping uh, Reuters and then importing that, you don't really want to make radical changes to that importer script. Whereas at the same time, you still want to be able to innovate on the front end, like the technologies I've just mentioned. You still want to be able to you know, adopt AMP, for instance. You want to do better do that quickly without you know, too much fuss. So you have an idea of an experience platform to which you can drive that out of. And how this could be done is, again, with my sweet Photoshop skills here, um, you can have your left-hand side, click, being the critical business system. So this is the, the systems you don't change very often. You can think of it like your, your content silo. And then on the right-hand side, you can syndicate that to uh, a Drupal 8 site, for instance and then it can deliver uh, the experiences for your, your, your apps, your responsive websites, you know, your decoupled front end, uh, etc. So this way you've kind of got a, a separation of concerns. And where this kind of gets 
really interesting if you do have more than one brand <coughs> is that you can you know, use that same data to drive more than one experience. So um, what sits in the, the middle here uh, is a product that Aquare does sell uh, called Content Hub, but basically it's a, a storage, uh, entity storage engine that stores your entities in JSON and uh, allows you to syndicate that out. So the idea here, Content Hub, uh, would be to deliver experiences um, to the the right user via the right <laughs> channel, access that same content through each one of those different plat platforms, and be able to distribute that content. So if you make an update in that piece of content on one site, you can syndicate that back to the next site. Uh, PHP 7, uh, hands up who's using PHP 7? Nice. That's awesome. So here's a slide. It's pretty compelling. Uh, this was done by Jeff Gerling, and he's a pretty smart dude, but he uh, spun up a bunch of uh, VMs. Uh, so they're not perfect, but they're as about as good as you're going to get without um, you know, doing it on raw metal. But this is PHP 5.6. It was the latest version of the time. It no longer is, but um, you get the idea. It's roughly twice as fast for uncached page loads and approximately twice as fast for cached page loads. And it's even faster than Hip Hop VM. And Hip Hop VM, for those who don't know, is Facebook's kind of compiling thing that turns it into C code. So somehow PHP 7 is faster than C code. I don't know how. And also consumes less, uh, less RAM as well. So those requests that you are serving, not only are they faster, they use less memory. So potentially this means that you can drop your hardware as a result of moving to PHP 7. If you use New Relic, this is what your graph could look like. It's a very happy graph. Again, why care about speed? <laughs> it's just hardware, right? Just chuck more at it. Um, well, page rank is one. Uh, you can save money, that's always nice. Then you can build new features. People like faster pages, so make them faster. And here's just a random stat, but about half the people expect a web page to load in two seconds or less. And I think Amazon proved that if they slowed down a page by 100 milliseconds, 1% of sales dropped off. So if you're doing it by a second, yeah, that's 10% or more. Especially to Drupal, oh, sorry, uh, PHP 7 Drupal 8 and PHP 7 really go together. Um, the test bot that tests core tested against 5.6, 5.5, and 7. So you're guaranteed that it will work with Drupal 8. Um, contra modules, I mean, as everything, then they vary depending on who maintains them. But um, in, in general, with Drupal 8, you're pretty much set. With Drupal 7, um, they've just recently solved a lot of bugs with it with PHP 7, but Contra again might be the thing you need to worry about. Um, but in general, Drupal 8, start there with if you want PHP 7. Um, on Aquia, there is a private beta, uh, which means uh, if you do want in, uh, you know, come chat to me. And uh, we can do it for non-production environments at the moment with the view that um, at some point in the future, you know, we can roll it out to production. We are waiting on a few things to become stable, quote unquote. Um, so Memcache uh, apparently has a version that may or may not work, <laughs> and New Relic is still dragging the chain. Uh, personalization. So this is often chucked around as well, but this is the idea of serving the right content to the right user at the right time. And this problem is specific to media, but potentially it will impact your clients as well. As they shift away from print, um, they're, they're basically noticing that their revenues like just been smashed. And even though they've moved to online and adopted maybe a subscription model in some way, like maybe a paywall or something like that, they've recouped some, right? But it's nowhere near the levels they used to have. <coughs> But a lot of the time, they don't even know who their readers are. 
They don't know what they like. They don't know how to sell to them. They just they might just send out an email blast. They'll go to every single one of the users saying, "Do you want to stuff kangaroo?" Right? And they'll go, "No, I don't like them." So how do you even know what your users like? How do you know what they like to spend their time on? So you need to, you basically need to track that. <coughs> you need to like you need to track them. So segmentation and personalization is a, a key requirement here. And I talk about Birda Media again. One of their properties is in style. It's not in English. It's not very fun to read. Um, but the idea was they had an anonymous only site, so no login, no sign up. And now they're tracking them, so they can they can basically track what content they consume, uh, what products they likely are using, and uh, all this context is kind of used. And how they use it is with this uh, concept of a third revenue stream. This is where you can market those products or those services to them, but rather than sort of shotgun approach where you're just going to you know, do it to everybody, you might go, well, actually I'm going to offer the, the, the toy kangaroos to the, um, you know, to the children and see what happens. Um, but you could also partner with uh, other brands or other sponsors to advertise their stuff through your site. And um, yeah, maybe look at using e-commerce as a, a way of recouping a bit of that money. And this is the CTO of Better Media. They already had the readers, they already have the tools, and uh, they had 52 million anonymous readers with no idea what they were really doing. And now they've got 52 million people put in buckets, put in segments, so they can send an email blast out to the people with a certain like or um, maybe a certain interest in a particular topic. And sorry, this should have been green. I do apologize. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll fix that for next time. Clearly, that's wrong. Um, so DDoS, um, we've already seen how to do that this morning with um, the sweet ping command. Um, <laughs> Uh, so what is a DDoS? Um, it's distributed, so that means it's more than one address, basically. Normally, it's all around the world. And it's a denial of service. And so basically, they're looking to impact your ability to serve regular customers' content. And how they typically do this is with uh, a flood, uh, you know, you can think of it like if you've got eight lane eight lane highway coming into your city, and you can take a thousand cars a minute, they'll send a hundred million, and then you'll soon notice that no cars are coming through, and that's a DDoS. And a lot of people will say, "Oh, it's okay. I've got a pretty good firewall." Um, well, that's kind of like having a, um, you know, like a, a toll bridge, right? But if you, if your cars can't get over the to the toll bridge, then what does it matter? And you might say, well, why do people DDoS people? You know, like we've already seen script kitties, they just do it for fun. Um, but something more malicious, I guess, is uh, competitors. You can hire DDoS bots. Maybe you want to extort someone. Maybe you don't agree with what they're saying. Maybe you just want to show someone else something you've done. And this graph is quite old, like maybe six months old. Um, so at, at Acquia, we do partner with Cloudflare, and uh, we get access to a few things. But um, this is attack traffic uh, for, what, like a month? And uh, it's measured in uh, gigabits for those who can't read it, and it goes up to about uh, 400 and something. Uh, to put this in perspective, um, uh, the total bandwidth of Kenya is 500 gigabits, um, so you can take out a country with this type of traffic. Um, so these aren't these aren't small. Uh, more fun facts, and this is not doing to scare you. Like there's no hacker typey here, right? This is what's, what's actually happening, and uh, DDoS attacks are relentless. Half of all application layer attacks, they'll happen again. So you think, ah, oh, it's 
gone away. I don't, I don't actually need protection. It's fine. Um, targets are hit once a week on average. Most people also think, oh, they'll be gone in half an hour. That'd be all right. It's only half an hour. Um, yeah, the longest attack was uh, 54 days. And you need to ask yourself, uh, is that a really a length of time I can do without my business? And this was also mentioned this morning, this is awesome. Um, so at KiwiCon, uh, for those who did go, this was a talk, I shamelessly stole the, the slide title from it, but um, the Internet of Garbage Things, and go watch the KiwiCon talk as well, it's actually amazing. Um, they di dissect a bunch of things like Barbie dolls and analyze them. Um, this is essentially what's creating your DDoS attacks. It's stuff that you buy that you think is a cool idea, like a light bulb that can hook up to your phone. It's your security cameras that you want to check from your phone when you're not at home. It's a smoke alarm. Like, who makes this stuff? Like, <laughs> um, so there's, there's basically one vendor in, uh, in China that makes these chips that are come out of the box. You can't modify them, and they come with insecure software. Someone open sourced the code to make your own botnet. It's called Mirai, M-A-R-A-I. So you can go check that on GitHub. And uh, you can go start poning some of these uh, devices if you want. This is a, a recent attack that Cloudflare saw, just a single site, uh, whereas the graph you saw earlier was ag aggregate. This is layer seven, so this is HTTP requests. Typically these are post requests. Typically these come with a rather large post body. We're talking, I don't know, half a meg, a meg, more. And we're seeing, I don't know, 1.7 million requests per second uh, coming in. Yeah, that's bonkers. This is all coming from Internet of Things as well. And uh, and Capsula, who's a CDN WAF provider, um, well, basically, they, they did their best to come up with some numbers around this. And an unmitigated attack, they said, is likely to cost around $40,000 an hour. And the impact is more than just, ah, oh, a few people didn't sign up and buy toy kangaroos. It's actually consumers lose faith in your website, right, because it doesn't work. Um, maybe data theft. Maybe they pinch some of your stuff and you end up on Have I Been Pwned? Um, maybe they pinch your IP and now you're no longer the only person who makes that product. So now that you've heard of the scary things, like how do I, how do I stop it? Um, basically it's a specialist task. You can't just uh, be good at IP tables. Uh, you need uh, someone with a lot of bandwidth and a lot of points of presence all around the, the world. Um, so there's a high barrier to entry. You don't see startups that do DDoS protection. Uh, we do partner with Cloudflare. We do resell their services. Aqua Edge Protect is what we call it. And uh, we can reach out to their version of me uh, to basically get um, direct technical advice when we need to, which is pretty helpful, you know? Like sometimes you don't want to deal with level one, level two. Sometimes you just want to talk to the the people who know what they're doing. Bit of a recap here. Sorry, team, it was a bit of a shotgun in the face in terms of uh, uh, information, but um, roughly that's what we covered. Did you want to hear have anything uh, to raise? Any questions? Hey, thanks. Um, I was just uh, wondering if you have any comment on the rise of HTTP2 and its effect it might have on Drupal, given that it's just doubled down a really strong HTTP1 um, set of tools. Yep. So HTTP2, um, I know Cloudflare supports it. That's the first thing. So, And then I believe that what Speedy was merged into that, right? Um, the protocol, but anyway. There's a bunch of performance benefits for HTTP2, um, which is the reason why you should be looking at this as well. Um, I probably should have a slide on that as well, good point. Um, so HTTP2, normally browsers are restricted to the number of resources they can download parallel, right? And the headers on those resources are not gzipped. 
Um, and that can be a problem if you're sending, uh, you know, 200k headers, which I have. Yeah, anyway, long story. Um, anyway, so it can make your website a bit faster, I guess, as well. And uh, Cloudflare already support that, so you just toggle that on, and then uh, yeah, you're good to go. Um, in terms of making it better for Drupal, I guess that does make it for better for Drupal. Um, I was thinking more about the um, assistant connection, so delivering content and maintaining the system connection. What kind of like a web socket or? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. I, Leveraging those abilities. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. I need to find out a bit more about that one. But um, yeah, web sockets have come up in the past. It's just that PHP is not a great uh, tool for web sockets um, because typically you need event driven. Uh, frameworks like Node.js is a, a good example of one. Uh, Ruby also have one. Um, whereas PHP is like I get a request, it's stateless, I send it back, and then I get another request. I have no idea what happened for the previous request. There's a new request, and yeah, um, it's interesting though. At Aqua, we are looking at that and uh, potentially seeing you know, if there's a use case to support more event-driven applications. Um, so I'd be keen to hear more about uh, the app or the idea or the website or, or whatever it is. Cool. Well, uh, thank you. <laughs>